There are three different types of markets, and we're going to look at the first one, which is the market of perfect competition. Think of a simple question. Why will the fair paying more for fair trade brand coffee not improve the living standards of poor Brazilian coffee farmers? And what the fair trade brand coffee is, is you can pay $3 more per pound with a promise that that $3 will go to Brazilian coffee farmers to improve their living standards. And let's assume that the money does get to them. Why in the long run will it have no effect on their living standards? In the same manner, why will the promise of fast food restaurants to pay 10 cents more per pound for tomatoes not improve the living standards of migrant tomato pickers who come to the United States to pick tomatoes? Oxfam encouraged a number of uh, fast food restaurants, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, to pay 10 cents more per pound, and in doing so, they promised that the money would get to the migrant workers to improve their living standards. Why will that have no long-term effect? And lastly, why will you likely never make money selling lemonade? The lemonade stand is a common thing to see in the summer with kids doing it, and of course they don't make any money, nor will you. And the reason for that is it's pretty easy to get in and compete those profits away. If you see somebody making a lot of money, you're going to step in and compete those profits away. The same thing with Mexican uh, tomato pickers who come to the United States to pick tomatoes and Brazilian coffee farmers. In Brazil, if I see my neighbor all of a sudden making a lot of money and he's growing coffee and I'm doing something else, I'm going to switch over to coffee. That's going to increase the supply of coffee, which will drive the price down to the point where the Brazilian coffee farmers are no better off or no worse off than they were before. So the assumptions we will look at with a model of perfect competition are, one, ease of entry and exit, homogenous goods. There's no differentiation, so it's not like, uh, you know, gasoline is not a, is a homogenous good. Milk is a homogenous good. It's not like an automobile, which is differentiated. There are many buyers and sellers, so no one person or one group of people control the market. There are no transactions costs. That's an important element we'll talk about a little bit later on. There are no contracting costs. There are no search costs. There are no information problems. When I walk out and I see the price of gasoline is $1.50 somewhere or $1.80, I know where the price anywhere, and it doesn't take me any more to get to that other station in case I want to get a lower price. And what we call these are price taker markets. No one individual sets the price. It's set by many, many buyers and sellers in the market, and you are a price taker, whether you're a buyer or a seller. So let's start with a market. We're going to look at a market of 1,000 identical firms. And notice that I have the quantity in thousands here. So therefore, this is going to be 100,000 units being sold in this market for $3 a piece. There are 1,000 identical firms. Each firm looks like this. They have the marginal cost curve that is decreasing at first due to gains from specialization and then increasing after a certain point due to diminishing marginal product of labor. They take whatever price is set in the market. In this case, it's $3. Each firm can sell as much as it wants for $3 a piece. It sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and produces 100 units. Each of the 1,000 firms doing 100 units is 100,000 uh, units in the market. Notice that the firm has no incentive to go beyond 100 units. In doing so, its marginal cost of producing anything beyond 100 is greater than the $3 that it would receive for that item. So let's say it produced 101, it may cost at $3.10 to sell that 101st unit, but it's going to receive only $3 in revenue, so it has no reason to go beyond 100, 100 units. And it also has no reason to produce beyond beneath 100 units, or less than 100 units. By selling more, it's going to cost it less than what it can receive in revenue, so it's going to continue selling until it gets to the 100 units, at which point the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue. The firm's average total cost and average variable costs are upward sloping. Notice that the difference between, or downward sloping and then upward sloping, they're U-shaped. Notice that the difference between the average total cost and the average variable cost is what? Think of the difference between fixed costs and variable cost. Variable cost and total cost is going to be fixed cost, so average fixed cost will separate these two curves. So let's take a look at a simple example. Let's say that in this case here, each firm faces an increase in its fixed cost. Let's say it's a, a licensing, a business license increase that each firm must pay, or maybe insurance that each firm must pay. There's no change in its marginal cost, so none of the other curves will change. It's only its fixed cost, so the average total cost increases. Now each firm is still producing 100 units because its marginal cost didn't change, 
but its average total cost of 100 units has now increased from $3 to $4.10. So each firm is now losing $110. It's losing $1.10 per unit on 100 units. What is going to happen in the long run? In the short run, these losses might be sustainable, but in the long run, it, they are not. In the long run, 375 firms are going to drop out of the market. That's this example. That's going to shift the supply curve up into the left. The market price now rises to $4, and now the market is producing 75,000 units. And how does this happen? Because the demand curve now faced by any firm increases. Now each firm can sell all at once at $4. It shifts back to, increases its output to from 100 to 120 units, and it is now not earning or incurring any economic losses. In the long run, in a perfectly competitive market, all profits or losses are dissipated. All profits are competed away or losses are regained after other firms exit the market and the price goes up. Let's look at that one more time. The average total cost increases due to some increase in its fixed cost. Again, we're going to say, say, an increase in the business licensing or a new insurance requirement for each firm. Therefore, each firm is going to incur a loss of $1.10 per unit over the 100 units it sells. That's going to drive some firms out of the market, which will increase or decrease the supply of goods, shifting it up into the left. The market price rises to $4. Each firm can now sell all at once at $4, which means its demand curve shifts up to $4. And now each firm is at the minimum of its long run average total cost, producing 120 units and not incurring any loss, nor is it earning any economic profit. We can do the opposite and see what happens when, say, a regulation that had uh, restricted its or increased its cost of hiring workers is repealed. In this case here, let's assume that repealing this labor law had no effect on its cost of labor because it really didn't do anything anyway. It just, say, had some onerous reporting requirements that increased the fixed cost of hiring workers and operating the company. So in this case here, the average total cost of the firm decreases and it is now earning an economic profit. It's still producing 100 units because, again, it can produce all at once at $3. Given its marginal cost has not changed, it still produces 100 units. But now its, total, its average total cost has fallen to $225. So it's selling 100 units at $3 each, but its average total cost is now $225. So it's earning $75 in economic profit, $0.75 cents over the 100 units. This is going to attract new entrants into the market which is going to cause the supply of goods to increase, the, the um, supply is going to increase, which is going to increase the output in the market to 120,000 units, which causes the price to fall to $2.20. This causes the demand curve for any given firm to fall to $2.20. It is now not earning any economic profit in the long run. Any firm in the perfectly competitive market will earn zero economic profit, nor will incur any economic losses. We'll take a look at this one again. The more average total cost decreases. This allows the firm or causes the firm to start earning an economic profit, 75 cents each over 100 units at $75. This economic profit attracts new people, new entrants into the market, thus driving the price down to $2.20. The demand curve for any given firm decreases to $2.20, and the firm responds by reducing its output to 90 units. Again, it's in long run equilibrium. We can look at another example here. Let's say the demand for this good shifts up. This increases the price. We call, you know, we can look at, say, the demand for uh, gasoline during summer months increases or the demand for milk increases. Let's assume, though, this is going to be a long run increase. Maybe this is an increase in the demand for sugar as people start baking more, whatever it is. In this market, the demand increases, which drives the price up to $4. This means the demand curve for any given firm increases to $4, and the firm is now earning an economic profit to the tune of... But since the, the marginal revenue increase, the firm increases output to 120, and it's now earning economic profit of, say, $1 on 120 units. What happens in the long run? Again, more entrance into the market drives the price back down to $3, this is going to shift the demand curve for the firm back down to $3. The firm resorts back right back to where it was. 120, 100 units at $3 a piece. 
There are now more firms, so the total in the market is 140,000, but there are zero economic profits being earned by this firm in the long run. What happens now if it's a marginal cost shift? Some increase in the marginal cost. Say it's an increase in the cost of labor, an increase in the cost of energy to produce each item. The marginal cost curve for the firm shifts upward to the left. This causes its average total cost to increase as well as its average variable cost to increase. The firm responds setting marginal revenue for the marginal cost and shifts and cuts back its output from 165 shifting to the left. This means again the firm is losing $1.20 per unit on these 65 units. In the long run again firms will exit the market this will reduce the quantity supply to the quantity demand to the market to 65 as the price rises to four dollars. This causes the demand curve for any given firm to shift back up and to the left. The firm responds by increasing the output to 65 and in the long run it's learning, earning no more economic loss or incurring no economic loss or earning any economic profit and selling at four dollars per unit. One more time the marginal cost curve shifts up this causes the average total cost and the average variable cost to shift up. The firm responds by reducing its output to 65 units. It's incurring a loss of $1.20 per unit on these 65 units. This means some firms exit the market, which drives the price up to $4. Any given firm remaining in the market has its demand curve shift upwards, which means it now sells all at once at $4. It responds by increasing output by 30 units to 95 and it's no longer incurring any economic losses nor is it earning any economic profit. Takeaway, if there is any entry and exit, if there are entry and exit in a market, many buyers and many sellers and the product is homogenous, economic profit or loss will be competed away in the long run. And again, when you see a neighbor earning a lot of money doing something that's very easy to enter into that market, you are going to move in and compete that away. In the short run, price is equal to marginal revenue, which is equal to marginal cost. In the long run, it's the same thing, except in the long run, there are no economic profits, so that each firm is operating at the minimum of its average total cost. This is at the minimum, the bottom of the U-shaped average total cost curve, where marginal cost intersects with the uh, average total cost. What are the criticisms of this view of competition? Number one, it's a very static view of competition. It says competition is simply competing away any economic profits by producing the exact same thing other people are doing. And that's not really a very, very dynamic means of competition. It's a very static view of competition. Perfect competition really is, is, uh, is trying to do what everybody else is doing when true competition is really seeking to create disequilibrium by producing more value for other people, by trying to do something others aren't in order to create more value to you. I'm not simply replicating what, what others are doing. I want to do something better than what they are doing and therefore I want to up, overturn this equilibrium. The assumption of zero information asymmetries and other transactions costs eliminates exactly what market competition is about. Remember, economics tries to solve the information and incentive problems and that's what markets are really about, are solving those information and incentive problems. To assume those away takes away the very gist of what market competition is all about. Market competition, again, is about discovering solutions to information and incentive problems, not ignoring that they exist. The very, very, very important piece by Ronald Coase in 1960 called The Problem of Social Cost, and in that, he does a great job of critiquing the model of perfect information simply because it fails to model markets as really what they are. Another great economist, Friedrich Hayek, has a great quote where he says, competition is by its nature a dynamic process whose essential characteristics are assumed away by the assumption underlying static analysis. And what he's really saying is this is hardly a good view of competition. It's simply showing how people compete away economic profits, but it really doesn't explain competition in a market very well. We will move on to the market for monopoly next.